Hello, my name is Alison McKenzie. I'm at the School of Sociology, Education and Social Work at Queen's University, Belfast. And I am going to speak about children in theory, theoretical methods and approaches for the study of childhood with respect to social epistemology. And I will begin with an introduction, a very brief introduction to traditional epistemology and social epistemology. Traditional epistemology theorized knowledge as if it emerged from an idealized, autonomous, rational thinker in isolation from social and political relations in search of justified and true beliefs. It was therefore highly individualistic, bent on evaluating doxastic beliefs and attitudes of the lone reasoner. By contrast, thinkers from social epistemology begin with the premise that knowledge is social and can be acquired from others. Truth, however defined or established, can be sought and established in communication with groups. Central topics in social epistemology include testimony, person-to-person -person speech acts, peer disagreement, how we reconcile differing viewpoints or beliefs, and judgment aggregation, how beliefs are reconciled or arise indeed within groups. In this presentation, however, I want to focus on a dimension of social epistemology that has flourished over the last 10 years, namely epistemic injustice, a valuable analytical method because of its focus on the moral and ethical dimensions of knowledge acquisition. Of concern is that while knowledge is socially situated, individuals have to varying degrees unequal access to and participation in knowledge practices, whether in the creation, production, dissemination or conveying of knowledge. Generally, the less power or social advantage groups have, the less likely they are to be able to engage in and influence knowledge practices. This unequal participation can lead to injustice, some of a profound nature. Simply explained, epistemic injustice is fundamentally concerned with a wrong done to someone, specifically in their capacity as a knower. This classic formulation comes from one of the seminal thinkers in social epistemology, Miranda Fricker. Her groundbreaking work, The Power and Ethics of Knowing, has revivified epistemology, which in its traditional forms, as I said above, ignored the relational aspect of knowledge, including, as I said, its ethical and political dimensions. It offers rich ethical and epistemological insights into why injustice persists. Despite her best attempts at ameliorating their effects through education, health, law, and human rights, including children's rights. So I will begin with this key thinker, Fricker's conception of epistemic injustice. In her construction of epistemic injustice, Fricker aims to explore how our everyday epistemic practices of conveying knowledge to others and making sense of our social experiences are blocked by unequal power relations. In her explorations, she examines the role of credibility judgments. Who is the speaker? That is her social identity. Identity power, which shapes who is believed and why. Identity prejudice, prejudicial stereotypes, social and individual biases in her judgments of the speaker's credibility. The social imagination, how persons are constructed. Epistemic trustworthiness. Can we trust the speaker? Hermeneutical lacuna and hermeneutical inequality. These are among the central concepts of the power and ethics of knowing. Fricker theorizes two kinds of epistemic injustice in our interactions with others, testimonial and hermeneutical. Testimonial injustice occurs when prejudices cause a hearer to give quote, a deflated level of credibility based on the speaker's class, age, ethnicity, sex, language, dress, accent, and so on. Prejudices, explains Fricker, are judgments which may have a positive or a negative balance and which display some typically epistemically culpable resistance to counter evidence 
owing to some effective investment on the part of the subject. So for example, we have the testimony of the teacher and the child. The child claims, I beg your pardon, the teacher claims the child was badly behaved. The child denies this. Who will we most trust and why? What harm is perpetuated if we discount the testimony of the child in favour of the testimony of the teacher? In what way is the child disadvantaged? Because we automatically usually discount what the child has to say. Or, and this is common, a woman goes to the police station to report that she has been raped. She's a prostitute and a drug user, perhaps. The accused, middle class and respectable, possibly a famous rugby player, vehemently denies the charge. Again, whose testimony will be given greater credibility? What prejudicial assumptions will be in operation and why? What is operating in the mind of the hearers? What stereotypical heuristics, that is, are operating in the minds of the hearers? They are in typically the police, the media, the judge and the jury. The second kind of epistemic injustice is hermeneutical. This occurs when, quote, a gap in interpretive resources puts the speaker at an unfair advantage when making sense of a social experience. An example of hermeneutical injustice is when a traditionally marginalized group, such as women or children, lack the linguistic or experiential resources to name and convey an experience such as sexual harassment or rape, when rape myths interfere with recognizing rape, for example, in cultures that still don't have those critical concepts, or indeed, where they exist, they're not taken seriously on account of who is reporting the social experience. If we don't take seriously the harm of rape or harassment or daily racism or misogyny, how can we address these harms and injustices? Why do we want to obscure these experiences from our understanding? What is at stake in sustaining or hiding behind ignorance? And this links to epistemologies of ignorance that I discuss later in this presentation. As she constructs her theory, Fricker, in contrast to most theorists of justice, demonstrates that injustice is a normal part of life, not an aberration. Noteworthy, however, is that epistemic injustice is so common in our communicative exchanges that we are barely cognizant of their prevalence or impact. And this very fact itself can constitute a hermeneutical blind spot. While Fricker is widely acknowledged to be the first to describe the structure and boundaries of epistemic injustice, we should recognize that there is a significant body of work from black and colored feminist writers who, while influential, have not had the same uptake as Fricker. Important writers include Linda Alcoff, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Guitari, Spivak, and to ignore the power of this body of work would be epistemically unjust. I now come to a second influential think thinker in epistem social epistemology. And this one, this time I will be speaking about Jose Medina. The theme of his book, The Epistemology of Resistance, 2012, is insensitivity, which involves being cognitively and effectively numbed to the lives of others. This epistemic vice means that, usually epistemically advantaged people, are inattentive to, unconcerned with, the experiences, problems, and aspirations of the disadvantaged, and are often unable or unwilling to understand the speech acts and social experiences of others. The epistemic injustice of the, of the kind described and analyzed by Medina are concerned with how knowledge is conveyed, received, blocked, or taken up by those who have power or are dominantly situated. Like Fricker, he examines the extemic injustices created by hermeneutical and testimonial inequalities, but does so in contexts of racial and sexual oppression in diverse communities within democratic societies. 
Medina is also highly interested in the forms of epistemic resistance in which marginalized and oppressed communities engage to undermine oppression and the structures that support it. Medina draws his influence from feminism, as does Fricker, queer and race theory to create what he calls a polyphonic approach to injustice. In addition to the ethical and cognitive dimensions of social epistemology, Medina also situates his analysis within democratic practices, as he argues, given the commitment to free and equal epistemic participation, democratic societies have an obligation to create the conditions in which this is possible. However, and as we know, different communities have unequal access to and participation in knowledge practices, such as public discourse, the free press, protests and dissent, Native Americans, Black and Hispanics in the USA, and perhaps the traveller community in the UK. Among the central concepts that Medina discusses are active ignorance and the epistemic vices of arrogance, laziness and close-mindedness, epistemic friction, epistemic resistance, culpable ignorance, and epistemic responsibility, and resistant imaginations that contest exclusion and stigmatization brought about by dominantly situated powerful others. I now want to turn to some developments in epistemic injustice, and I will turn to the idea of epistemic oppression. Key here is the work of Christy Dotson, who has written on how epistemic harms constitute epistemic violence that can lead to epistemic oppression. When anyone from a particular social identity, such as women, children, people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ are routinely or actively excluded from knowledge practices, they, ep they experience epistemic and political violence. Epistemic oppression refers to, quote, epistemic exclusions, afforded positions and communities that produce deficiencies in social knowledge, Dotson 2012, to the detriment of particular kinds of knowers. Epistemic oppression is pervasive and extremely hard to eradicate. Denials of racial discrimination, sexual harassment, exploitation, or indeed any social experience that causes the knower harm because of accusations that the speaker is lying, paranoid, fantasizing, exaggerating, or cognitively and effectively ill-equipped to really make sense of an experience are all commonplace. Conspiracy theories that deny the existence of COVID-19, for example, or that a mass shooting occurred would fall into this category. Dodson has also developed the idea of contributory injustice, which is caused by an epistemic agent situated in ignorance in the form of willful hermeneutical ignorance in maintaining and utilizing structurally prejudiced hermeneutical resources that result in epistemic harm to the agency of a knower. Dodson differs from Fricker in that she argues that there are many kinds of hermeneutical resources from which we can draw. And these include counter narratives, counter mythologies, ways of knowing that exist within marginalized communities. And Medina also makes this point. On Fricker's account, hermeneutical gaps occur when both the hearer and the speaker struggle to make sense of social experience when the right conceptual resources are unavailable, such as sexual harassment until the early 70s or coercive control until very recently. In a sense, they are symmetrical in their lack of hermeneutical resources. However, Dawson contends, as does Medina, that marginalized communities can articulate their experiences at least to each other. What they may struggle to do is to convey that experience intelligibly to dominantly situated others. Epistemic injustice naturally links to epistemologies of ignorance, which are not simply about not knowing, but about how ignorance can be deliberately and willfully manufactured and sustained. 
Sometimes what we do not know is not a mere gap in knowledge or an accidental epistemological gap that simply needs to be rectified. Think of the many times that you might have said, ah, I didn't know that. Now that I do, I will. Rather, these gaps are deliberate or actively produced. During slavery in the southern states, Blacks were not allowed to read or write. They were deliberately kept ignorant so that they could not understand the injustice of their situation and to prove they were not intelligent enough to learn, so were fit only to be slaves. Dominantly situated knowers, white male judges, for example, can refuse to acknowledge the epistemic resources and experiences of the marginally situated women which allow them to ignore, misunderstand, or misinterpret a whole world of experience. For example, marital, intimate, or stranger rape. In cases such as these, the dominantly situated fail to give uptake to the legitimacy of the hermeneutical resource that the marginalized can provide, such as that there, are, there is such a thing as intimate partner rape. I now come to children in epistemic injustice. Based on Fricker's account of epistemic injustice, Barras and Tollefson, for example, have argued that children as a class are subject to testimonial injustice and do not receive the credibility that they deserve. Speaking specifically of contexts in which the child is called on to testify in forensic cases, Children's testimonies are not taken seriously because they are regarded as irrational, animalistic, suggestible, incomplete, deficient, and unreliable. Children, they argue, are subject to identity prejudicial credibility deficits and prejudicial treatment, which means that their experiences of abuse, neglect, discrimination can go unchecked. Given children's lack of social power, they are rarely in a position to challenge these conceptions and the deficit model of childhood that provides them with support. Carol and Gjorfi have similarly argued that in clinical practice, children tend not to be believed or listened to when they describe their symptoms and are highly susceptible to epistemic injustice. The adult's interpretive analysis and conclusions tend to trump those of the child. So I now come to children and epistemic injustice, some limitations. There is little research that focuses on children and the epistemic harms they endure in all spheres of life, the home, education, the health, social care and criminal justice systems, employment. As discussed above, children readily fit into all categories of epistemic injustice on account of their age, vulnerability, to sexual, physical, emotional, and psychological abuse and exploitation, and because of the how the child is constructed within the social imagination as deficient, untrustworthy, unreliable, cognitively and effectively immature, and as lacking in rational and reasoning capacity. These are all issues that have been extensively explored in children's rights. These shared imaginative conceptions of children's social identity emanate from identity power, which is exercised over children by adults. As a consequence, because children suffer identity, prejudicial credibility deficits, they are wronged in their capacity as knowers and made to feel less than human. Children have to contend with widespread epistemic prejudice, which can have a detrimental impact on their development as epistemic agents and discovers of knowledge. Not being listened to can have dire consequences for children. Epistemic injustice offers highly important insights into why children's rights and the child's voice struggle to be taken up by the dominantly situated and the epistemically privileged. Parents, teachers, police, social workers, health practitioners, policy makers and politicians. Such an approach, epistemic injustice that is, would dovetail extremely well with research on children's rights, capability approaches, theories of power and vulnerability, theories that are going to be explored, explored in the seminar series. 
I will now address some common mistakes in the application of epistemic injustice to case studies. While children and epistemic injustice is rife for further e exploration, a key issue to be aware of is the distinction between unjust practices and unjust epistemic practices. Often researchers will describe practices that are discriminatory, unfair, insensitive or harmful, or which they deny, or which I beg your pardon, deny equal, equal or equitable, equitable access to important goods like education and healthcare. They fail to show what is epistemically unjust, namely that as knowers of their own social experiences, epistemic agents are unable to convey in part contribute to contest, dissent, participate in knowledge practices because of systematic identity prejudices that track the person through different dimensions of social life. For example, and this comes from an area in which I teach and research, children with disabilities or additional learning support needs in schools are too often treated unfairly with insensitivity and excluded from class or school for poor behavior. Children with ADHD or attention deficit hyper disorder are a classic case in point. Autistic children are another. Social disadvantage, exclusion and marginalization have unfair, unjust and unequal outcomes that can have lifelong adverse consequences for these children. Thus far, we can probably agree that we have identified strong inequalities and unjust practices and outcomes. However, there is no evidence yet of epistemic injustice. If we were researching this topic from the perspective of epistemic injustice, we might, for example, want to know from ADHD children themselves what it is like to be a child in a school designed for and catering to the able-bodied or minded. If, in giving us their accounts of social experiences, we discounted them on the grounds that their teachers gave articulate accounts of their behaviour that match the researchers' own expressive styles and biases, then we have begun the process of credibility deflation of the child's testimony and credibly inflation of the teacher's testimony and indeed the interpretation by the resource researchers. Further, the child recounts incidences of being ignored by the teacher, being sent out of class for the least infraction, being given unsuitable work, while clever but similarly ill-behaved children are treated more favorably. If questions are raised over the trustworthiness of these accounts because the child has a bad reputation, comes from a chaotic family and takes Ritalin, we are epistemically undermining the testimony of the child's social experience if we in the process discount what is conveyed to us. We are putting her at a disadvantage, excluding her from giving valuable testimony that could change teacher attitudes and practices in the classroom at least. If the child raises objections, but is not listened to because she's a bad type, we are in the territory of epistemic injustice. And finally, I will now speak about the value of epistemic injustice in childhood research. The value in research that focuses on the child's testimony is that it dovetails with children's rights that emphasize voice and listening. It enables researchers to explore what goes on structurally in terms of prejudicial stereotypes and attitudinally attitudes of belief in speech acts, giving testimony, and how social and identity power play out in silencing or enabling children's voices. It helps us to examine what it means to be a knower of one's own experience. Can stigmatized children not know or explain or convey what it means to be unjustly treated? They can. And there's plenty of evidence to show that children can make sense of their own social experiences if given the right situation, circumstances, and ask the right questions. And if we do listen to these experiences, what will we learn and thereby know? And what will that mean for injustice or creating the conditions for justice. 
Finally, the construction of epistemic injustice offers an elegant and analytical means by which to examine children's experiences of epistemic injustice. Thank you. <laughs>